Hi, Julie Usher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. In a recent video, I showed you how to make this castle cookie where I focused on how to get the texture on the sides, the windows in place, and all the details on each of the tiers. But I didn't go into any kind of detail on the flags, the trees, or the rocks, and some of the other interesting accessories that really make it sing. So in this video, I'd like to focus on those elements. In the first part, we'll be talking about how to make royal icing trees that use a little fondant core as their infrastructure. I'll also be showing you how to make marbled rocks that are very lifelike using royal icing putty. And I'll, lastly, I'll be showing you how to make a flag which makes use of a fondant flagpole and a wafer paper flag. So one other note about these accessories before we jump into the video. While they're specific to this castle, to some extent, they're really actually pretty generic because any of them can be scaled up for a much bigger cake or scaled down to fit the top of the cupcake. So as we're going through this video, I encourage you to think creatively about how you might use these techniques on other types of sweets. Okay, so what you'll need for this video, three-part video, are a number of things. For the trees, you're gonna need a little bit of green fondant to make the central core, some royal icing to pipe the leaves, and some toothpicks for holding them in shape or in place while you're piping. For the rocks, which is part two, the marbled royal icing putty rocks, really simple. You just need really thick royal icing. This is a great use for leftover royal icing. Tinted two or three shades. I've got three shades, one off, off to the side, which we'll use later. A really dark tone, a medium brown, and maybe a white. And then lastly, for the flags that went on top of my castle, and also on each of the tiers of the castle, you'll need a little bit of brown fondant for the flagpole and some wafer papers. I like to use two colors for the flag. We'll also accent that with a little bit of royal icing. Onto the trees. I have two types of trees on my castle. Ones that were designed to look sort of like a Mediterranean cypress tree, tall and slender, that are piped with a round tip. And another which is designed to look more like an evergreen. This is a drooping evergreen. Here's a more sprightly evergreen piped with a leaf tip. And I'm gonna show you how to do both. They basically follow the same set of steps, though they just use a different tip. So I'd like to start by making a fondant core to support what I'm piping. And I use, I'm just using green fondant, something that's gonna match what I'm gonna pipe with. And I'm gonna make a really super tiny one. The, the larger the core, the larger the tree. So the smaller the tree, just make the smaller core. And I'm gonna make a pretty small tree, so I want to take even a little bit off. And I just am rolling it so it's pointed at the top and there's a wider base, obviously, so it ends up being a nice tree shape. And then I'm sticking it just on the very end of these toothpicks because you want to be able to remove the toothpick easily later. I like to have the toothpick because it allows me to pick up and move the tree as I'm piping much more easily than if it were sitting down on parchment paper. These are all about one and a half to two inches tall. This guy's maybe two and a half inches tall. This is one I formed earlier. Then I'd let them dry a little bit before I start piping. Not, they don't have to be dried solidly, but just enough so that they're not flopping around on the end of the toothpick, maybe a few minutes. Okay, so I formed the central cores, which can be used for either the evergreen type tree or the Mediterranean cypress. I'm gonna start with the Mediterranean cypress, basically the one that looks like this, uncolored, and here it is with a little bit of additional coloring on it. And for that, I'm using a number five round tip for this coarse texture here. If you want a finer cypress tree, here's the difference. The one on the left here uses a number four round tip. So you can get differences in texture just by changing one tip size. And my first step is to just pipe a little point on the top with very thick royal icing glue. This is about as thick as I can get it so that it holds a nice shape. Here I piped a tree earlier with slightly less thick icing and you see how the petals all ran, the leaves all ran into each other? I don't like that effect, I want them more distinct. So be sure your icing's really thick. I've thickened this one up considerably, so hopefully it'll do the job. So the point is on the top. The next step is to start a row of leaves by creating a bead, pushing up, pulling down. And I think I can fit around three around the top, three or four, pushing up, pulling down pushing up, pulling down, pushing up, pulling down. And now if your icing's pretty thick, you don't have to allow much drying time between applications of rows. You can just keep piping. If it's too loose, you want to thicken it up or allow more drying time between the rows. I'm going to continue piping because I have thickened up my icing. Just the same vein, just adding more beads in each successive row. I'm cleaning my tip each time 
too with either my finger or a clean towel. I try to stagger the beads. It doesn't always work out that way, but if you can stagger them, great. Meaning put pipe one in between the ones in the row above. And this is why it's convenient to have it on the toothpick because I'm just, or the skewer, I'm just rotating as I go. And we'll continue in this vein all the way down. When we get down to the bottom, I may lift it out of the styrofoam just so I have better access to the bottom to pipe some pieces at the very, very base. And you can see how this one's just holding a much more distinct shape than the one I showed you earlier, and the difference there is just the thickness of the royal icing. Now here's, I'm, I've come to the bottom. I'm having a hard time getting access from my point of view, so I'm gonna pull it out and put some ones at the very bottom. Just to fill it out. Taking care not to ice it onto the stick because I do want to get it off later. That's looking pretty good. It's a little crooked on the stick, but when we pull it off later, it'll be nice and straight. Now I'm going to move on to show you how I did more of this evergreen effect. This guy's a little droopy evergreen. The bottom petals are kind of drooping down. Here's one that's a little more perky. And that's just a difference of how I hold my tip relative to the cone, relative to the central core. For this particular tree, I need a different tip though. Here I'm working with a 352 leaf tip. Just using the same icing, just swapping out. I'm gonna try it here, just swapping out the tip. Now I just want a teeny little point at the top, going straight down with the tip if I can. That looks good. And with this particular one, I'm gonna start actually at the bottom and work up. It's just easier to lay the leaves that way. Before the, the leaves were kind of overlapping one another here, I don't really want them overlapping too much. So pushing, again, applying a lot of pressure, releasing, pulling out for the bottom rung. In, out. And pulling rather abruptly at the end to create a point. Now on the one with the droopy petals, my angle was more like this relative to the cone to keep them exactly sideways, you want your piping bag perpendicular to the cone. Now I'm gonna add the next level. Again, staggering in between leaves and rotating as I need to get access. You could do a majorly big one of these as a big Christmas tree. So, you know, you can scale these up to almost any size. So just bear that in mind. I do like to clean the tip periodically or I get a little rough I get less of a clean pipe. Here towards the top, I start applying, I apply much less pressure because I want the petals to be smaller. And because I'm not pushing as hard on the cone, sometimes the icing doesn't stick as well. I come in and shape it. This is also why it's important to have that central cone pretty firm because in pushing, I'm knocking over the tip a little bit here, see? But we can fix that. Just push him back in the right direction. Here we go. Oops. If they get too big at the top, I just pare them down with my hands a little bit. And now I'm going to show you how you might add some color to them so they have a little, some, a little more dimension. Okay, so this is a completely optional step, but if you want to give a little more color, I've simply mixed a little bit of my normal green liquid gel food coloring with a little bit of extract. I like to extend it with extracts because they dry faster than if you were to extend it with water, just to dilute it. And I'm going to sponge on a little color here. I'm starting, it's best to start lighter because you can always go darker, but if you get too much down, it's harder to take it off. I kind of like that. It just highlights the high points of the tree and just gives it a little more depth and dimension. Again, purely optional. And you're, I'm doing this on a, tr a tree, not the one I just piped, but one that's dried completely. Otherwise, you'll smudge what you just piped. So that's one way to apply color. Now, on something like 
the evergreen, if I want more color on this, it's really hard to sponge that without knocking off all the tips of those leaves that you just carefully piped. And again, this is one I did earlier that's completely dry. So it's better to use a regular brush for this and just highlight one at a time, like so. And again, I just think this gives it, livens it up a little bit. You could just touch the edges. I'm actually touching the tops of the leaves and starting again light with a pretty light, loose color, meaning more extract to coloring. The more coloring you add to the extract, the more opaque paint you'll get. And I just wanted a subtle highlight here. So two different ways to color as well, depending on the type of tree. I'd now let them dry completely before I put them on something edible. And to do that, typically I do like to remove, remove them from the skewers so people don't run into toothpicks when they're eating and to just simply pull them off. You might need to give them a little twist if they were stuck down particularly deep. So for the rocks on the castle, I actually use royal icing putty, which is a discovery of mine when I had a lot of leftover royal icing, as I often do for my projects. I discovered that it had dried out, but it was actually so dry that I could actually mold and shape with it without it sticking to my hands. I thought, hey, I'm going to use this icing. You could alternatively make these rocks both in big and small size using fondant, but I thought, hey, I've got this extra icing. Why not use it? So I'm just going to show you this technique. I think it's kind of innovative. It's sort of an uh, extension of royal icing transfers. So to make rocks, I like to work with at least three colors and I just, of the putty, and I just kind of put them side by side. Again, random is fine and twist them until I get a nice marbled effect. Twist and, and roll them in my hands until I get a nice marbled effect. If your hands do get tacky, you know, I've got some powdered sugar always nearby to keep it from sticking. Now that's pretty in and of itself and make a nice big rock. The step Next step is just to sit it on an acetate lined sheet because this will respond if you, stick it on, if you stick it on a normal cookie sheet without a lining, it may not pop off. And then if you want to shape it more over here, you can, but let it dry completely. Something big like that will take a long time to dry, maybe a week. <laughs> not a week to pop it off, maybe a couple days to pop it off, but it might still be wet part part way through the center. These small rocks will dry easily overnight, if not in a few hours. So depending on the size, they'll take a little more drying time before they can pop off without smushing. So if maybe a couple of days for something that big, it'll still be wet inside and just overnight for the small rocks. Here's just an example of a smaller, medium-sized rock. And we'll be using these to fill out the landscape at the bottom of my castle at the end of this video. So that's simply it. When it's not in use, if you have a lot left over, just simply cover it flush with plastic wrap, store it in the fridge, and it'll be good to go and last like this for many, many days. On to the flags for the castle. The first step in making these is to make the flagpole so that they set up completely rigid and firm because they need to be that way before you can apply the flags to them. For that reason, I'm not using modeling chocolate as I used on other parts of my castle, but rather I'm using a quick setting fondant, colored brown, that will dry overnight quite rigid. I'm using Satin Ice brand. Modeling chocolate is just more temperature sensitive and it's likely to wilt. Something freestanding like this could wilt if the temperature gets warm in a room. So to make the flagpole, I'm just simply rolling out a really long log, a really slender log, just by rolling it back and forth between my hands and cutting it at areas where it looks relatively uniform. You see it tapers off and gets thin here. I don't like that. So I'm going to just leave that one as it is, roll it off to the side and roll as many as I need to make the flag poles. Set them aside to dry overnight and then we're ready to attach, make and attach the flags. Now for the flags, I'm using wafer paper just because it's really delicate and, and it can be bent into nice little contours that look very flag-like. So I'm using two different colors for this flag. You could use one if you'd like. And this is really just as simple as cutting a triangle out of the paper or some other flag-like shape. I'm gonna cut a triangle with a red stripe down the middle and cutting these whatever size you want them. I've made a bunch in different sizes, which I'll show you in a sec. So I've cut my triangle, my flag shape, and then for the stripe, I just want to cut a single straight, straight line out of my red paper. And you could use a paper cutter for this if you want it super duper straight. 
And then to stick that down, I tend to prefer, you'll notice there's actually a rough side to wafer paper and a shiny side. I prefer to have in this particular, for this particular project, I want the shiny, flatter, less rough side up. So just be aware of that. And to stick the two together, I like to use a touch of corn syrup. Yeah, water will stick them together, but too much of water will cause the flag to bend in strange, uncontrollable ways. So I, where possible, I use corn syrup. We are going to use a little bit of water, though, to actually bend the flag in a moment. And then just stick it on down where it's extending off the tip. I'm going to trim that up again to a point. Now that flag is super duper flat and straight, has no wave to it, and the one I showed you earlier obviously did. So the next step is giving it some wave, and you can give it as little or as much as you want. And this is where I do resort to a little bit of water. You can sponge this on or just get your finger barely damp, and barely damp. If you get it too wet, as I said, it will dissolve. And this gives it enough flexibility that you can bend it just manually, or you can wrap it around your paintbrush and give it a little twirl. We'll bend it forward. We're going to bend it forward and then back. So there you have a little curve to the flag. Now, once you get that where you want it, I'd let it dry a little bit before I put it on the flagpole. You see I got a little too much water there and notice how it's eating up the wafer paper. So you have to be very careful in your application of water. I let that dry because it will take on a different shape as the, it continues to dry. And once it's fully dry, then you're ready to actually attach it to a flagpole. And I've got some pre-made flags of different shapes and sizes that I did earlier just so you can see the range that's possible. Very, very tiny as well for the top of my castle. I'm ready to stick it down. I'm going to take this flagpole because it's a little bit straighter. And for this, again, I'm going to choose, let's see, which flag do I like the best? Maybe this guy because it nestles right around the flagpole really nicely. And to stick that down, I'm, again, I'm going to go back to the corn syrup so there's no risk of distorting the wafer paper and just s attach it right onto the flagpole. It's nice to work on something like this cutting board that's very small or round, cake round, so that you can easily move these things as they're drying. It'll take maybe half an hour or so for that to dry completely firm to the point that you can pick it up like this. So if you're doing a lot of them, you want to have it on something that you can easily move it around on to make room for the next that you're making. Now as finishing details, you'll notice I have some little white dots. I'm always one for adding details. So we're just going to add a little, few little dots to these. And for the dot work, as usual, I've got royal icing of beadwork consistency. It forms a nice little dot on its own. I've got this tip hardly open because I'm going to do teeny tiny dots on the side of this flag. And I'll open, I'll open it up a little bit more for the big yellow dot on the top of the flag. So just trimming out the edge. I could get a little closer to the cut edge too if I want to conceal that a little bit better. And then I'm going to turn it towards me to get the dot on the top. Alternatively, you could let this dry and pick up the whole thing later and put the yellow dot on top. But I don't think my flag's on there quite securely yet. So let me just pipe it lying flat. And there you have it. Finished flag. Again, I'd let that completely dry and then we're ready to deck out our castle landscaping with trees and rocks. Okay, what to do with these accessories we made. They could go on any kind of project by varying them slightly, but I'm going to use them to deck out the landscape around the bottom of my castle. The castle already has some of the flags on its tiers. And if you haven't seen that castle video, do check it out. But I want one in the foreground here. We're going to take one of the trees I made earlier, one of the evergreens, pop it in here, and maybe a couple more of the marbled rocks. So by now you're all experts on how to make royal icing trees, marbled rocks out of royal icing putty, and flags using fondant and wafer paper. At least I hope you are. 
One last note, again, I said this at the beginning of the video, but I think it's important to reinforce. Well, I made these for my castle project. They are certainly generalizable to other types of suites. So think creatively about how to use these various mediums and techniques to design other accessories of your dreams. Till next video, live sweetly.